They're your all jokes fun and exciting. on, on uh, Instagram are good, Autumn. I don't know where you come up with those, but some of your, your mobilization funding jokes, those are clutch. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. That means so much to me. Oh, we lost Jenny. Jenny will be back in just a moment. Um, okay, we have participants rolling in. Um, hopefully Jenny will be returning in just a moment. <clears throat> Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hi, thank you all so much for joining me um, and my special guest today. My name is Autumn Sullivan. I'm the Director of Marketing for Mobilization Funding. We are a specialty lender working specifically with construction companies. There, Jenny's back. Um, we do contract financing and purchase order financing. You can learn more about us at mobilizationfunding.com, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Um, so first, I want to give my panelists uh, an opportunity to introduce themselves. Seth, let's go ahead and start with you, and then we'll do Stacy and Jenny. Great. Thanks. Awesome to be here. My name is Seth Farger. I, uh, I live north of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, my company is actually called Heightened Creative. Um, it's a creative marketing agency. I started six years ago. Two years ago, I started focusing on construction and realized that to the typical construction uh, company owner, Heightened Creative doesn't sound like much that they'd be interested in. So we're gonna talk about branding later. I, I chose to rebrand part of my business as construction video pros. And that's what I do now is build websites, shoot video and take photos and other marketing tasks for um, construction companies. Uh, so that's, that's me in a nutshell. I'm married, I, I have three kids. Uh, if you follow me on LinkedIn or social media, you'll see a lot of pictures or videos of my son and his John Deere plastic tractor, who is three and hysterical. So um, I'll throw that out there. Hi, I'm Stacy Holsinger from Steel Toe Communications. I started my marketing consulting business about nine months ago now. Um, I have experience, over 15 years experience working in mechanical construction, civil engineering and home building, um, helping companies with their marketing. So right now I'm working with a lot of smaller mid-sized contractors to help them compete in the market um, with the much larger people. Uh, and I live in Newmarket, Maryland. Uh, most of my clients are in the DC area, but I do have some clients on the West Coast. And I focus on email marketing, social media. Uh, I do a little bit of video marketing, um, uh, newsletter writing, um, anything that relates to content pretty much. And I am married with a three-year-old son. I am Jenny Nix McGerald. I am the marketing director for Element Engineering. Today is day six, so my 30-second um, elevator speech is a little rough, so bear with me. Um, Element focuses in the transportation infrastructure industry. We provide transportation engineering, civil engineering, structure engineering, surveying, subsurface utility engineering and utility coordination services. We are headquartered in the Tampa Bay area where we um, provide services throughout Florida. Um, and we are a disadvantaged business enterprise in the state of Florida. Awesome, thanks guys. Let's go ahead and uh, get started. And we're gonna start at the beginning. We're gonna talk about branding. I, I think that branding is one of those um, topics that a lot of people know is important, but don't necessarily know what it means. Often it's confused for, yeah, I have a logo, I have a business name, maybe I have a website. Um, and we know that branding is so much more than that. The uh, quote that I shared today, actually, in, the, in LinkedIn was, I'm going to put it up on the screen super quick. So everyone can see it. It's a quote from Jeff Bezos, and it's your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room, which is a controversial statement. Some people disagree with that, um, but I think it is important to acknowledge that your branding is about a lot more than just your logo. Um, Seth, do you want to start here? Can you talk about your philosophy around branding? Absolutely. I uh, thanks. Um, like like you say, whether people agree or disagree, um, marketing to some degree is subjective. People have different opinions of what's the most important, what's the most effective, what works in one industry might not work. Same, same is true for branding. Um, 
my personal philosophy is I think branding is largely about two things. The first recognition, if people know who you are and what you do, when they see your logo, drive by a job site, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak in terms of um, construction language because that's what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. See your job site, um, an invoice with your letterhead comes across the table. Anything, every touch point that you might have with people, do people know and understand and recognize who you are and what you do? Um, and second to that is the feelings that that sort of brings up. If it's a, if it's a feeling of angst, you brought up a Jeff Bezos quote. Somebody might be, I don't like Jeff Bezos that's part of his brand. We just came from Thanksgiving. So some of us had meals, probably the crazy aunt Edna or cousin Eddie, and they're a brand. When cousin Eddie gets brought up, you know what to expect because he has a personal brand. And the same thing um, happens when we build a brand, everything that, that, that is associated with that brand can invoke a positive or a negative feeling. Um, and you can spend a ton of money building a logo or a website or a something, but if it's not, if people still have to ask, yeah, but what you, what do you do? You're kind of missing the mark. And mm -hmm. so, um, maybe it's a budget conversation, which we'll get in later, but I believe branding specifically for construction needs to quickly and conveniently illustrate who you are and what you do without question. And you can spend a hundred thousand dollars or $200,000 and get a bunch of brilliant marketing minds in a board a boardroom in New York city to say, here's a font and here's a color and here's a shape. And this invokes this feeling. And this is what people are going to think. And it means this, and it elevates that. And this is what they're going to see. But uh, I don't think the construction industry needs that because they still can miss the mark. At the end of the day, you need people to know and understand very quickly who you are and what you do. Uh, everything after that is is uh, a little excessive, in, in my opinion. So um, I'll let Stacy and, and Jenny uh, have the floor on branding because I know they both have great ideas as well. Sure. So on your note um, to everything that you're saying, I do want to give some tips when it comes to logos and identifying who you are. So especially when you're a small or mid-sized contractor and you don't have a large marketing budget to work with, but you know you want to rebrand or refresh your logo, or maybe you, you had added more services onto your brand and you want people to uh, recognize that. Or, you know, the thing about construction is most of us in our names, it's a family name or it's an acronym like DPR, mm -hmm. JB. G. Smith, you know, and if you have a large marketing budget or a large marketing team, you know who DPR is or JBG Smith, right? But if you're an underdog and or you're a smaller company and you're EES um, or HPS specialties, no one knows who you are. So you have to work harder to, you know, you have to work harder in your logo or your brand messaging. So, um, there's a couple things to consider. So when you're thinking about your logo, first, do you want to do a conduct a competitor analysis? So check out what your competitors got going on. I recently worked with um, a glazing contractor and all of their local competition chose the same exact colors. So they're all, they all look the same across the board. So you want to make sure that the colors are different than your competition. Um, so Another thing about colors is you want to choose two colors or less. And the reason for that being is once you do define your logo, the cost and price hikes up print wise when you get to three plus colors, mm -hmm. not just that, but your logo is less memorable because it, you know, we're inundated with all these logos that we see all the time. And you want, you want it to be really simple and really clean and really easy. Um, so if you're thinking about that, the other thing with logos, you have to consider, um, make sure the, desi the design isn't too intricate and it's simple because your logo has to be, you know, scrunched down to fitting on like a pen, uh, promotional items, real small, and then really big blown up on the big screen. So you have to really consider that when you're designing your logo. Um, I think uh, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention, so when you're a smaller or mid-sized contractor, again, like you don't have a big marketing budget to work with, but you still can um, represent what 
um, services that you offer. So if you are like an acronym, like EES, make sure in your uh, email signature, you spell out your services every chance you can get. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly what we do on the business card too, on your website, everywhere. Um, make sure it's very clear what you provide, because if you can't, you know, if you don't have that big budget, you've really got to spell it out for people. And I will just chime in, Stacy. that was um, a great list of uh, specific mechanics to remember. Um, and Seth, you said earlier something about the feelings being evoked when people think about your name or your brand or whatnot. Um, I would just remind everybody that specifically in the AEC industry, people work with people. It's all about relationships at the end of the day. So as you're thinking about what your brand is, maybe the logo, maybe the website, all these other things, remember first and foremost that your people are your brand ambassadors. So if they don't know what you're trying to do, they can't support you. Um, the other thing is, is that you want to make sure that these people are on, um, on brand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't want to use that word, but yes, they are on brand. They have their messaging. Even if you're doing something as simple as providing a quick bid to a contractor, um, for a small project or whatnot, your, whomever your client is working with, that person is your brand ambassador. They're going to help continue to um, build your image with the community as a whole and your clients. So just remember that um, working with people to ensure that they have a great understanding of the overall brand and purpose of your company. That's a great point. Um, and, you know, I really feel like every communication that you have with your potential client is, is a branding moment. And particularly for the small businesses, the smaller contractors out there, like to your point, Stacey, um, who don't have the big budget dollars, they invest in the hats that match with their logo and the, you know, the polo shirts and their whole team wears them. But if your team isn't empowered to then act on brand, they look on brand, but they also have to act and communicate on brand. And that's not, that's like a bigger conversation, but it is a big part of branding. Like when I used to, you know, when I used to go to, to other companies and, and do branding workshops, I would always meet with the customer service department because really they're the heart of the brand. Like, who are you when something goes wrong? And how do you communicate with customers when things are challenging? That all of that is part of your brand as well. Um, since you brought it up, the emails, I did wanna ask you, Jenny, about um, if you had any tips on turning those moments into marketing opportunities, like if you're sending a proposal, how can you make your proposal stand out from a marketing perspective? Well, um, proposals, even simple bid pricing lists, whatever, even if you're considered in a, a commodity code and you're looking at just getting the lowest bid type thing, that piece of the sales cycle is pretty much the cherry on top of all your marketing Sunday, everything you've done up until this point. So it's important to make sure that everything leading up to this submission of your proposal or bid is that it's in there. Um, you you demonstrate you've heard what your client's been saying. You you understand where they're coming from, their pain points, their challenges, and how you can offer that solution if it's a qualifications type proposal. Um, again, it's just the sort of it's that it's that it is a moment, but it's it's sort of a culmination of many moments, and you want to show more than anything else that you have been listening and you hear what they're saying and you are there to support them because that's how you have a repeat client. That's awesome, thank you. I, I, I uh, when I work with clients, um, when I used to do freelance marketing, I would remind them that your email signature is a great marketing moment. It's always there. 
Um, mm -hmm. and, and a tip that I learned just this year, um, and I love, and we've been using in our own efforts and really seeing the value of is putting a PS underneath your signature that, and that is the, the CTA that drives to a value moment. So if you have a really cool video about who you are as a company, you put PS, want to learn more about, you know, ABC contractor, and, and then you have a link off to your video. Um, and the, the, the click through rates on that are really quite impressive. So that's, that's my tip for, for email marketing. Yeah. And to add to what you're saying about the email signature too, you can also link it directly to your websites, all of your social icons. Um, you know, it's not just who you are, but who your company is, what your services provide, and then use it as an, um, call to action, drive them somewhere else on your website, if, if hiring's your thing and you're looking for people that you can encourage, you know, if you have a large organization and you're really struggling to hire, make sure that's included in your email signature, like apply here, you know, right to your careers page. Mm -hmm. There's a huge opportunity in the email signature for call to action. So let's go ahead and talk about the, the, big, uh, the big rock of marketing. Let's talk about websites. Um, we work with a lot of smaller contractors and a lot of them don't have a website at all. Um, and when it comes up in conversation, what we often hear is, well, our business is hundred percent referrals. So we don't, we don't need a website. Um, which just as a marketer, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> yes, you part did. of me just died inside. <laughs> right. The tiny part of me just had a heart attack. Um, but Seth, I know you've experienced this as well. Um, and I know you had a story about someone saying that they had kind of a, they had an older website and, but it was fine enough for them. So would you mind telling that story and then kind of talking about why companies need to invest in a website, even if their business is mostly referrals? Absolutely. I, I had worked on a company for about a year and a half, finally got around the table to have a conversation about helping them redo their website. Uh, been in business 40, 50 years, long-standing history in the community, multi-generational. Um, those are all the reasons that they're in business. And, and, and in that kind of discovery meeting, they just said, you know, we've only, we acknowledged, we all agreed that they didn't have a great modern website uh, that really illustrated who they are or illustrated it well. And they said, you know, we've, we've only ever gotten one, one lead from our website. And I explained to them, so you understand that your website is probably not as good as it could be, yet it brought you a lead. Is it possible that a well-engaging, impactful video that does a better job of displaying who you are and quickly showing that you're an authority in your space might bring more and kind of sat back and the light bulb went on. So um, yeah, that's, that's, the, that's, that's one of many examples. Um, there's a lot of, of belief and perception around the value of a website. What I always explain to people, regardless of whether your business is 100% um, referral or low bid, people are looking. On the low bid side, um, there's a lot of people that submit bids. And if you're the same or close to the same as somebody else, what's going to be the deciding factor? Maybe an existing relationship, um, but if you're relying on relationships and that person at the DOT or whoever's comparing bids, pops over to look at this website and sees an impactful, engaging video that shows a company that's investing in their people, that's got clean equipment, that's got well-maintained equipment. Um, do you want to bank your referrals or your, your relationship solely that you're going to win that job? So it just gives people a, 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 a more of an opportunity to see who you are and what you do and, and build authority. This is who we are. This is what we're good. And people... It, it's about le um, legitimizing who you are. Oftentimes I've had a company, uh, a concrete manufacturer that sent me a text that he got from a superintendent that they were already working with. And the guy just, they'd already done the job. They were already a customer. And he just sent him a message. said, I just want to tell you guys, you have a really great website. We look forward to work working with you guys in the future. That was a, that was a after the fact that mm -hmm. he was telling them that the website was good. They were already a customer but it goes to legitimize who they are. It shows that companies are willing to invest who they are. And then the whole, the whole looking thing, um, external people are searching online for site work companies. Um, massive developer out of town 
is maybe looking for a site work company or a paver or a painter or whatever you're in, a HVAC uh, uh, supplier in that area. Maybe they got their people, but it costs them a lot more to, to come from out of town. It saves everybody money if the people working on site are going home and feeding themselves and everything at night, then paying for outside lodging and things like that. And so people are looking for local subs to do that work. And then recruitment and employees, everybody's feeling the strain of, of needing help. Um, I don't want to keep, I keep giving these stories, but they illustrate so well. I had a guy contact me and said, yeah, we need, a, we need a website. Actually, we have a parent company who needs a new website too, to be perfectly honest, they own us. And if I was looking for a job and I looked at their website, I probably wouldn't apply. Right. Um, so again, perception um, is huge with recruiting. If someone's a, a 25 year veteran equipment operator and they don't necessarily, uh, they go look at your website, you may, be, you may be a 60 year company that's been around forever and they might go elsewhere because the, the content they see the, per, the perception that they get is that this other company is more established or treats their people better or something to that effect. And so those are a few examples um, that I that I highlight when talking to people about the importance of websites. Stacey, you guys, you just launched a website today for a client. I can, you, uh, can you share what you do? Do you have like VIP pages, the pages that every company has to have as a minimum website? Oh, well, that depends on what you're looking for, but I guess if you're a smaller, well, it really depends. If you're a vendor supplier, um, you know, you probably, you only need a couple, a couple pages because uh, you're working with manufacturers. Um, but then if you're a small GC or a sub, you know, that could be up to like 14 pages or something like that. It depends on you know, the projects that you're working on and what you want to highlight. It depends if you have a hiring problem. Um, but what I can say, well, what I wanted to say first is Amanda had a great point in the con, and I know Amanda, she's great. Um, so some people do rely on social media, right? Instead of uh, building a website. The problem with that is, as we all know, social media can go down. You don't own social media. And Facebook could go away one day, one day. So they also have, you know, their own format, their own rules, and they control Facebook or Instagram or however. So you need control of your marketing and your brand, and you'll get that by having your own website. So that's the importance there. Um, but what I would recommend for, you know, smaller mid-sized contractors when you are developing your website, some of the things that you want to make sure, especially on the homepage, is define if you're commercial, residential, or an industrial contractor. This is super important because I get phone calls all the time that, you know, from an HVAC company that will say, we, we keep getting residential people that are calling us and we only do commercial. So you want to try to like cut down on those phone calls by making sure in all of your marketing that you just say you only do commercial or you do commercial and residential or, you know, whatever, but just make that message really clear. The other thing on your homepage, you want to make sure the location, what is the territory that you guys do? Are you a national? organization or do you only work in a 75 mile radius of DC something like that you want to make sure so when the out-of-town guys do find your website they know exactly who you are whether you work in commercial what locations you work in um, testimonials are also great you want to make sure you have that on your website um, this was a conversation on LinkedIn not too long ago we don't have a place in the commercial contracting industry where, you know, except for Google reviews, where people are leaving those comments. So that's the only place to really do it where people can learn about your company and whether or not you're a good contractor. So you want to make sure you get testimon testimonials and permission from your clients that you can put on your website. So when people do see you, especially on the homepage, you know, they're legit comments. 
Um, another thing that I don't see on websites that I'd like to see more often is, um, especially from the smaller contractors, if you hire interns or apprentices, they're visiting your website and they need to learn more about your company and what you offer. So make sure you have a spot for that. And also an FAQ section. Um, you, your website is strictly for your clients. It's not for you to brag about your company. You know, you want to make sure that when your clients are visiting their website, your website, they get all of their questions answered and you establish yourself as a thought leader and an expert in what you do. Um, so those would be my tips for your website. <laughs> Jenny, did you want to add anything before we move on to our next topic? Yeah, I'll just wrap it up by saying um, we do still, to my point earlier, it's a relationship business for sure. But uh, these days we're all attached to our phones. So if we're, your website is really a virtual business card and when I get a text saying, hey, do you know of a firm or a contractor that will do X, Y, Z? If I don't happen to have the contact, but I'm like, oh yeah, that one company we worked with them, they were great. I can go real fast and just shoot them your website immediately and be like, yeah, contact this person. And um, so, yeah, remember. Which, which also speaks important. to the importance of mobile, right? Like mm -hmm. you should have a responsive website because if Jenny sends that like, oh, check out this person and sends that website link, and they try to open it up on their phone and they can't, well, they're going to move yeah. on, right? Like they're going to be mm -hmm. like, well, that wasn't like, I'm not going to do the hard work to find this, right? We're all busy. So mm -hmm. make sure your website is responsive. Mm -hmm. um, since we started talking one. about Facebook. Oh, did you want to say something? Seth? I had one more thing. That's a good segue to, to Facebook. We can talk details of websites, the importance of, mm -hmm. of imagery or video or SEO or those different things. And a lot of that is very overwhelming to people. One of the themes we talked about for this call and for companies to not feel like they're drinking from a water hose is a crawl, walk, run strategy. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing nothing, do something. If you're not spending anything, spend something. Um, and as it relates to websites, it is a tool uh, and it's a two-way street. It is not just something for people to find you. It is something for you to be active with. My, my friend, Aaron, who's tuned in with the construction channel. If you're not familiar, it's like a, a Netflix for the construction world. They got lots of cool stuff on there. Um, he had mentioned to me that, that's, that so many construction companies don't value websites because they get no traffic. Well, part of it is how much, how much you're pushing it from social media, which we'll get to, how much are you doing to work to drive traffic to your website from your signature, like you mentioned, Autumn, um, with, a P, with a PS or, or those kinds of things. And so mm -hmm. having a website, yes, it's crucial, it's important, get it there, and then start looking for ways to optimize it, to drive traffic to it, to get it in front of people uh, and that kind of thing. And so I wanted to, to make sure and point that out because, um, and social media, here's the segue, social media is probably mm -hmm. the easiest way for us all to drive traffic to our websites. Well done, you nicely go. done. You can, thank, you can thank me later for that segue. Thanks for the see <laughs> Um, Okay, so um, social media, strangely enough, is, uh, is another platform that I see a ton of value in and I have a lot of contractors, uh, I mean, in, in my career, a lot of other industries as well, but construction seems to be one of them where they say, oh, it doesn't work in our industry, particularly the, con the commercial contractors. They're like, oh, well, my people aren't on Facebook. My people aren't, they don't use LinkedIn um, or they don't use Twitter. So Stacy, I know you and I did an entire webinar on social media for <laughs> the AEC industry. Do you want to go ahead and kick us off on this topic? Oh, I don't know where to start. Um, yeah, so this is, this is one of the marketing initiatives that I probably get the most pushback from when it comes to owners of big, you know, large or not large, smaller commercial contracting. Why should I even be on there? I notice most of them that say that don't have accounts themselves. So, um, there's a lack of understanding of, of the value that social media brings. 
I also noticed it's very much a generational thing. I have a lot of uh, younger um, family members that are going to be taking over the business in the, in the next like five to seven years. And they're pushing, you know, their parents or whoever's owning the company that they're related to. Come on, we got to be on social and they just can't get the, the benefits across to them. Um, but social is not going away anytime soon. You know, LinkedIn's been around for 20 years. It's the top B2B business to business platform. We're all on here as a community talking about commercial construction. <laughs> so, you know, um, it's, it's not going to go away. It's a great tool. It's how we learn about each other, our companies, how we can help each other. Um, it's another form of marketing or or I'm sorry, networking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have in-person networking, which is old school, but very, very important. And I would never say not to do that. Um, but you have to digitally uh, participate and connect with people virtually. That's never going to go away now. Um, so you have to make sure that you're, you're missing out because, uh, if you're if you're just doing the in-person thing and you're not connecting with people, you're missing out on so many different conversations um, and your competition is going to beat you to that. So that's that's just some things about social media. But the four top platforms that the commercial con- construction industry should be involved with is Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram and YouTube. Uh, YouTube is your second largest search engine. It's also connected to Google. So that's going to help with your SEO. And we'll talk about video marketing. Um, But those are definitely the top four platforms. And what I can say with my personal experience in 15 years in this industry, Facebook is usually, you know, the platform that your employees like to get recognized on. There's a lot of communication with the employees and referrals. It's a great place to maybe experiment with some recruiting ads. um, Because as we know, this is very much a family based, um, the construction industry in in general, it's very family based and, and everyone on Facebook, it's very much connected with their friends and family. So that's where you're going to make those referrals there. So that's the importance there. LinkedIn is where we're having professional conversations about what's going on in the industry. And people love to see what other projects people are working on. Um, So when you're, those seem to be the most uh, engaged posts. So when you're talking about your projects and you're giving recognition to your suppliers, your subs, your vendors, your GCs, people love to talk about the projects that we're working on. The same as, you know, you hear that story and, you know, your dad's pointing at all the projects that he built in the city, that kind of thing. So that same thing's going on, but on social media, um, on LinkedIn. The the tip I would give for posting, though, be very careful that your posts aren't egocentric and they're customer centric. Mm -hmm. Um, Me and Seth talked about this yesterday, but um, so egocentric, egocentric marketing is just kind of our old school marketing and where you're talking about, um, look at me, look at the quality we give. We have the best experience, top, uh, top safety, you know, everyone's saying that. So you got to be careful talk about, you know, the challenges that you all overcame on the project. Um, talk about trainings that you offer, like anything that will give, uh, thought to the customer and solving their problems. You always want to keep the customer top of mind. And then Instagram, you have your pictures and you're showcasing. And Seth could probably talk about Instagram more because he's more that visual content person. And then YouTube, you know, feel free to take take the reins with those two. I want to add real quick because there's a great question that I empathize with. Michael Dutcher says, what if you're opposed to social media platforms? Michael, I am opposed to most social media platforms. I despise being on Facebook and the constant just (laughs) barrage of stuff, but I can't deny that there's nine, I don't know, nine billion people, a billion people. I don't know. My numbers are wrong. There's a gazillion (laughs) people on Facebook. Despite what the kids are telling people about TikTok and Snapchat and the other million of them, Facebook is still 
the primary social media probably for your customers, the, the, the reach you can get with Facebook ads. I do ads for a painter down here and I can go target people within a one mile radius of a pin that I drop on a peninsula of Lake Norman and just show it to people that live within that and put his ads there. And so mm -hmm. that's sort of your people are on social media. Um, so I empathize with you. I don't love it. It can be a, it can be like drinking from a water hose, but you don't have to post five times a day. I don't even recommend that. I wouldn't post every day, even necessarily Stacy would be great to talk about the strategy, hire her to talk about that and your messaging and get that because fewer well-crafted posts are going to do more for you than just throwing stuff out there. I also want to say to Stacy's point of not like egocentric. There's a way to build authority without thumping your chest. Look at me. We're awesome. A client I've worked with that I'm dying to, I tell them, I'd like you to, you need to brag about yourself a little bit more because they, uh, they invented the slip form machine. Their product is on like six continents, maybe five, uh, maybe six. Like that's marketing gold. You don't have to brag to the world, but just explain your authority. We started this back then. We've evolved, we've grown, we're, we're American made, made in Salisbury, North Carolina. We've got people that have been with us for 50 years. Um, we've got multi-generations, like all that stuff just gives people the warm and fuzzies when they watch your video, they want to do business. Um, it makes them feel good about doing business with an American made company. So in their example, those are things for them to, I say brag on, but they're not, they're not thumping their chest. They're just telling their story. And that's, that's part of a huge part of marketing is telling your story and do so with authority. So you carve out that space and that niche as being the authority in, in your field. Um, There's a, that's a key point that you just said, Seth. And I, I wanted to, to bring it up because in, in creative writing, um, which is what my background is, I don't have a background in marketing. My background is in English and in writing. Um, we have a mantra show. You're not writing well though. So right. you're, you're, you're doing for it. <laughs> is a, the, our mantra is show, don't tell, right? Um, so don't, don't tell me you did a great job. Show me you did a great job. And I think in, in, in marketing, one of the ways we do that is we focus on the customer. We tell the story of the customer. And by focusing on them and telling that story, we show how we helped. We show our authority without ever having to say we're the best, we're the, you know, we have the most, whatever, all those things that everyone, old, that old school marketing focuses on. Instead, we just focus on the customer and tell that story. That's the, um, and to the, you know, I also hate being on Facebook. Like I hate it and I don't go there that often, um, but I can't deny that it's in the top five traffic drivers to my site every month. <laughs> I can't deny those numbers. Like it just is what it is. So I don't engage it with the parts of Facebook that I don't like, right? Like I just go post good content on our company's site and respond to the comments. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we have so much to get to. Um, let's go ahead and talk about video. I feel like one of the biggest barriers to video is the cost. Everyone thinks that it has to cost a million dollars to have a video. Before we, just we get the video, can I just answer Lewis's yes. question? Because it's yes. based on social media. So he said, what can you what can you say about recommended business development efforts for small general contractor firms? So when it comes to social media, I would focus on LinkedIn for your B2B mm -hmm. um, and make sure you're participating in group discussions. You have a strategy. Oh, one of my clients had a strategy the other day and I'm going to mess up uh, the numbers because I, I did not write it down. So I have to talk to him. I don't know if Chris is on this call, um, but it's, you know, make sure your business development team spends time on LinkedIn, whether you post twice uh, a week, just say, mm -hmm. um, you have, you uh, have a commitment to reach out to a couple connections per week and um, you post on other people or you visit your target um, customers and engage with them on their company pages. Mm -hmm. So that's a social strategy for a business development person um, on social media. You also want to make sure that you fill out 
uh, your profile. There's so many people in our industry that are still not doing that. Um, make sure that they understand your brand, what you represent, what services you represent. You have a, a nice banner in the background that represents what company that you represent and work for. So, um, but LinkedIn is where it's at for business development. I just wanted to get that answer in for you. Absolutely. Our sales team and our CEO, um, ha we have a monthly LinkedIn meeting where we talk about what are you going to talk about on LinkedIn? And we make, you know, I make sure that all three of them are, are posting regularly and, and, you know, sometimes they're like, help me say this, you know, <laughs> which is something that I think is important just real quick. Like if you are afraid to start posting because you're afraid of how you will sound um, or that you're, you know, quote unquote, not a good writer, like I advise you to go spend an hour reading other people's posts on LinkedIn because people who are hugely influential in the construction industry space are not English masters. They, what they are is authentic people. You know, like we forgive a spelling error when the story is compelling. We, we don't care that you don't know where a comma goes if you are speaking from the heart. That's like, forget all of that. Put all of that grade school grammar stuff out of your head and just tell the story or just make the point that you want to make. Just start talking because what LinkedIn really is, is just an, a, an amazing place for real conversations with people. Um, so just like Seth says, if you're doing nothing, just start doing something and, and see how it takes off. I would recommend like optimize your page. Talk to Stacy about that. Full disclosure, because we're being real here, Stacy was helping me optimize my LinkedIn page yesterday because my <laughs> byline was catchy and saying things that I wanted. And she's like, it doesn't make it painfully clear right off the bat what, what you, you do. do. And I even updated my image. I had an awesome uh, profile image. She's like, change it to something with you taking a picture of a piece of equipment. And I did. And so um, those, those, those matter very, very greatly. Yep, they they really they really work. Uh, LinkedIn provides us new leads and closed one leads every month. It's which which didn't start until our CEO leaned in hard and started checking LinkedIn every day. And now he's completely addicted to it and loves it. He's like a huge presence on there. <laughs> but he was very hesitant in the beginning. We had to have a whole conversation about how it was okay to just be yourself on that platform. Well, um, you definitely have to have a strategy and spend time and know that your strategy is long-term. Don't just post one time and think, ah, oh, no one's connecting with me. That's not how this works. Like you have goals throughout the year and try to make those goals. And then you're going to start seeing that leads will come in and you're connecting and getting more opportunities. I promise you. Let's go ahead and we've got about 15 minutes left. Let's talk about video for a little bit. Let's go ahead and get into the video conversation. Um, Seth, I know video is your bread and butter. Um, so if a company invests in a produced video, um, what strategies do you recommend for them on, on extending the shelf life? Because I know Stacy has a story about how long those videos, but if I'm gonna invest in a big video, what do I do with it? You have to begin, I always advise people begin with the end in mind. So what are you hoping to, like a lot of people, I want to put it in a video, okay? What do you want to do with it? I don't know, tell our story. Okay, who's it for? Customers, is it a recruitment video? Is it a process video? Is it for new hires and no one outside of the business will ever see it? And so, um, first of all, establish what you're wanting to do with it. Uh, and, and many video won't ever go beyond the confines of a safety or training media me, uh, or opportunity or meeting and that's fine. But begin with the end in mind, what, who's going to be the end consumer of it? Is it for a, a sub? Is it for a customer? Is it for a GC? Um, is it, are you trying to win someone over with it? Or are you just trying to tell your story? What's the end goal for that video? And then that's going to determine how you're going to create it, what story you're going to tell, and then ultimately how and where you're going to publish it. Um, as it relates to social media, social media is huge. Social media is is quick hype and it's going to have a, a low shelf life. YouTube and Stacy can talk about this. YouTube has less hype beginning, but it lives forever and it, and it ramps up. And mm -hmm. so it, it, it's like a snowball that keeps getting bigger as it rolls where Facebook or Instagram, the other ones generally tend to trend down. Um, and so uh, the, the thing that is the biggest component or asset to video in my mind 
is that it gives you the opportunity to control the narrative. So if you think through, man, people just don't understand what we do. I keep having the same conversation over and over again. Take your frequently asked questions that Stacy talked about, use that to develop a script and so that there's no denying who you are and what you do at the end of the video. And you said showing, showing is telling. So you, you build a video, your, your script answers all those frequently asked questions and the imagery just supports that, whether you're HVAC or site work or asphalt, you're building authority. You want it to start here and the person's emotions to, just to be going, wow, yeah. And by the end of the movie, they're going, geez, this is, this is who I have to hire. I had, a, I had a, a very high up executive in a company remark on a, a much, much, much smaller concrete company's video that I did. And he's like, gosh, I got done watching that video and I wanted to go apply to work for him. And I'm like, they probably couldn't afford you. But, but he, he it invoked with him and told the company culture, how they train their people. They believe in their core values that building strong, capable, confident employees will yield better jobs for their customers. And, and it, was a, it was a, here's who we are, here's what we do, and we're successful because of our people. And it was just a huge call to action, come join our team at the end. And it, it made that guy. So um, knowing, knowing how and where you're gonna use that, Stacy has a lot of good information about teasing videos and things like that, that I'll, I'll let her speak on. But those are some of the, the big ideas around video. And then it's a tool, it's, it's, it's an outbound tool. Put it in your signature, send it to people. There are still people, sending a one page like this, like, who are, what do you guys do? Or, Hey, we'd like to get on your, your bids list. Could you just like, you sent a word document on company letterhead. Um, and, and that's, that's, I won't say that's not marketing, but in this day and age, it's not good marketing. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess uh, to add to all the wonderful things you just said, um, two quick stories about video marketing. We had did a low budget video for a day in the life in HVAC tech for a mechanical contractor that I had worked for. And um, we drove traffic to the careers page. And this, this video, I don't know how old it is now, maybe eight years old, is still to this day driving traffic um, to you know the mechanical contractor's website and people all over are learning about this mechanical contractor now. Um, Another one would be, you know, if you have, you were talking about the capability sheet, why not do a video on your capabilities? If you have a fab shop or a project that you want to highlight from beginning to end, that's so much more valuable um, to showcase what your team can actually do than just listing it out on a paper. And most of the time when you do have um, something to share with that, you know, the biggest mistake that commercial contractors make when they do decide to do video and they look at the price and they're like, man, five to $10,000 or something like that, that's a lot of money, but your video is going to last for you for years down the line. Mm -hmm. And it's going to last for you if you have a video strategy to go with it. So what that looks like is, you know, you create your video and then you contact your videographer and you're like, can you please give us a couple 30 second teaser clips with that? Mm -hmm. You can use those teaser clips for Facebook ads when you're recruiting people, um, or you can just use them to start um, the buzz, build momentum about the video that's coming out um, over a couple weeks. You know, you don't want to just you spend a year tracking a project, right? And you spent all this money and then you just post it once and forget about it. And then you get so discouraged that the numbers aren't there. There was only a hundred people that watched it. It's because you didn't have a strategy and you weren't building buzz and momentum up um, with your video. So the teaser clips that you want to spread out, you can also use the video to do um, a private tour. Um, you could invite clients in and host like a little movie or a happy hour or something like that. Um, and they could watch the video with you. If they don't want to do that, you could do a virtual presentation. You could also do a sep separate event for employees um, where you do a virtual presentation or show the video at your yearly holiday party. Um, that helps, you know, build company retention. People are proud, that kind of thing. And then after that, 
you publish it on social, me social media um, live, and then you want to do an email campaign out to your clients. Um, so you do this over a month or two time and people, the buzz is starting to uh, create over time and you'll see that the engagement numbers are going up and people are more likely to share the video that you invested in. Absolutely. Jenny, did you want to add anything to the video marketing conversation? Um, video is not my strength, so I will leave it to the two experts. <laughs> it is not my strength either. I tell you, in, 20, in 2020, when we all had to go home for the pandemic, um, our CEO, Scott Peeper, said to me, I want to do YouTube videos. And I was like, mm, I don't know how to do that. And but <laughs> But we started bootstrapping it, and um, it is now one of our top marketing platforms, uh, and we we love it. And we do we work with a videographer for some of our work, but also sometimes Scott just talks to the camera and answers commonly asked questions, or he'll get on the camera and say, "I just got off a great call with a client. This was their problem. This is how we solved it," and we just. And, and then I create a super quick design in a free tool called Canva. And I'll put a link to that um, in the description for this. Um, and then and then we have a new video. So, you know, crawl, walk, run. If you're not doing anything, start, mm -hmm. you can start small. I mean, we literally started when everyone was stuck at home answering the questions our, our clients were asking. What can I do with this PPP loan? How do I figure out if I want to furlough my employees or, or, you know, or let them go? It was, and we just asked our expert network, which is the other thing, right? Build your network, have, have other people come on to your video. It doesn't have to always be about you. Um, so we have, we only have about eight minutes left. Ah, so I think one of the topics that we really need to talk about is budget because it's, I think it's one of the stumbling blocks with marketing. How much should I spend? Why should I spend anything? How do I prove the ROI? All of that fun stuff, um, particularly in this industry where I don't know what you guys experience, but my experience has been um, someone's kid does the marketing um, because they're there and they're young. And so they know, right? Like they know Facebook there. So, so let's talk about what companies should realistically um, be looking at in terms of budgeting for, for marketing? Um, well, let's start with what you just said. <laughs> so there, there's problems with getting someone on board that, you know, might they could understand social media, yes, but do they have a marketing background? Can they simplify a message? Do they understand commercial construction? Because that's where you're going to run into a, a ton of branding problems and they can make a really critical mistake and mess up your brand. Mm -hmm. um, and once it's posted, you can delete it, but someone can take a screenshot of it. So you got to be really careful. Um, so based on what you said, my best advice would be, you know, you can hire an entry level marketing person with a marketing background. That's great. But you have to have a plan to make sure that this person is included in your strategic planning meetings. They're learning about your products and your services on a regular basis. So you're giving them the training, whether they're participating in vendor trainings or whatever, um, getting involved with the safety team, because God forbid you post a picture that you think is fine, but you didn't run it by the safety director. And now you have a OSHA citation photo on your website, which by the way, happens a lot when you're not familiar with the industry. So that's why you don't want to hire someone that just knows social media. Like, please do not do that. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, if you don't, if you want to hire an entry level person and you're going to invest in their education, that's a solution. Or you just hire someone with 15, 10 years of experience that has been through all these life lessons. And you're going to feel that peace of mind that those mistakes are not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So those are the points on that. Oh, and then real quick for outsourcing, um, 
if you're going to just choose a marketing company that's not familiar with the construction industry, I've seen so many mistakes happen with that. First of all, they're using eye stock images of guys in trenches that are squeaky clean that look like they just got a manicure done. Like that does not represent our industry at all. They don't have even a paper cut on them. Like who's going to want to go work for that person? Um, and then the other thing is with that, you know, I had a client who uh, hired an out outside marketing agency and they just got all these eye stock images and these images were of a company over uh, Asian workers and their their whole safety gear was completely different because of the weather conditions over there mm -hmm. not to mention it was all Asian workers in their on their website photos mm -hmm. and it's in United States you know, the state's uh, website. So you got to be really careful about that. You have to choose someone or a marketing agency that has a construction background. So those are my comments on that. <laughs> Just be careful. <laughs> I, to go back to your thought about budgets in general and how to create them and nobody wants to talk about money. Nobody wants to talk about spending money because that's just dirty. No, we don't do that. However, there is a uh, um, truth to the statement, you have to spend money to make money. That doesn't mean you just uh, shove money out the window and see how it goes. You can be really intentional with where you develop your budget. There's a variety of ways to develop a budget, but I have found over the course of my career, um, and while I've spent the majority of my career in this industry, I've been in other industries as well, that um, goal-based budgets are pretty much the best way to be mm -hmm. um, pretty mindful with where your money is being spent and will be able to show you the most return on investment. Um, to kind of wrap in that business development question. Um, so as a, as a leadership team, you, you figure out what your goals are for the year. And from there, you develop um, your micro tactics, which include things like the video, social media that we've been talking about, and also just um, where you might have to, participate in industry organizations or community organizations where your clients are at and things like that by looking at your tactics maybe you'll do um, a website maybe you'll do a mailing those still work actually um, all of those thinking about those micro tactics and then putting that, plugging in that information and then giving yourself a little bit of a cushion is a great way to just have a really solid budget that won't, um, that'll be pretty close to accurate. Um, budgets are flexible overall, but as you're going down, you might have to pivot. But um, it's, it would be easy to say, hey, you need to spend 3% of your sales revenue mm -hmm. on marketing or 10% or whatever. But at the end of the day, the best way you're going to know and actually achieve your goals is by having that hard look at, your, at what your goals are, what your micro tactics are going to be deployable. And, then, and by having micro tactics built into your budget, if you know things shift, you have to maybe make some cuts. That's easier way to look at. You can cut some micro tactics that way. So, and that'll help with your return on investment. I love that. Mark, um, Mark Drury has a comment in the chat about speak to people about investment. And that's, I can say that's very much how I've handled. Um, I worked in for marketing agencies for most of my career. And when we would go to clients and we would say, we're going to ask you for, you know, $5,000 a month or $8,000 or $12,000 a month. It, it's a huge ask. Um, doesn't matter how big the company was. They, they were all like, Oh, that's a huge amount. But when you, when you reframe it as you have told us your goal is X in order to reach that goal, we will have to, you know, if it was wedding bookings, for a wedding company, we would have to say, 
well, in order to get that, we would have to drive this much traffic. In order to drive that much traffic, we're going to have to do these micro tactics. Those micro tactics are going to cost this. That's like, and really reframing the conversation as an investment toward the goal has been very helpful. And it's what I do here. You know, I, I look at what our sales goal is um, and then work backwards from there. What do I need to do in order to reach that? And then how much do I need to spend in order to make that happen? Uh, it just really reframes the whole the whole conversation. Um, oh, and good go marketing. Good marketing is is an investment that appreciates. It's tax time. People are expensing things, buying equipment, paying for trucks. Let's buy the CEO a new truck because we got to spend money and whatever. But everything, every single one of those things, depreciates as soon as you buy it and start mm -hmm. using. Good marketing to the YouTube, to the social media, to photos. If you got a great photo of your equipment doing something from three years ago um but it's it's still applicable and that guy's still with you you can use that on into the future you can continue using images not to mention the 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 snowball we talked about with youtube and stuff so good marketing is an investment that appreciates over time and then we got stacy and i got a question yesterday about margins and slim margins and projects don't think about this one job has to I got to write the check now, but it's not coming from this one job. Divide that because that website, that video will live over the next year, two years on in the future. When you look at it, it's like, oh, but if we take half a percent off this project or 1%, we're paying for it now, but actually in all reality, it's dispersed amongst that because it's not only related to that. So that's a way to overcome that for all you to take to your CFOs that won't let you spend marketing dollars. Yeah, it has a it has a long shelf life. So and you can repurpose things just as Seth was saying. So you know, just because you post something once doesn't mean the right person saw it. Um, but if it had good engagement, you can repurpose that post. That's why sometimes on your feed, you'll see people post the same thing a couple of times. And yeah, it's a little annoying, but um, you have to stay consistent with your message. So it rings with people and yeah, it can have a, a longer shelf life, especially, you know, when we were talking about video and everything like that. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, we've even found that our some of our top performing blog articles are from two years ago. Um, and and they, they consistently are in the, you know, the top five pages visited on our website. So we made videos of them. We made infographics related to them. And we actually, um, we don't blog as much as we used to. We do more video now but we share those blogs on social media over and over again because they're because they're popular because they're a top performance driver so the the investment in those blogs has long been spent but but they're appreciating in value um so did you answer the google ads question that was in the chat yes that was did awesome um <laughs> so we're a few minutes oh, over go ahead I, just, I hope I answered. I don't know if I did, but I threw out an, I threw out an answer. <laughs> we're, a, we're a few minutes over. I did want to ask this one last question, and I did want to tell the audience I will be sending out a webinar replay for everyone um, as soon as I get this and I do the magic in YouTube to make that possible. Um, and it will include contact information for anyone you want to contact with. So I'll include your LinkedIn info. Um, Seth and Stacy are both uh, consultants. And so we'll make sure that you have uh, their website information as well. And if we didn't get to your question, uh, please reach out and maybe we can do a part two of this. We can make it a regular thing. Um, but my last question for each of you is, what do you think the number one thing is that holds companies back from, particularly in the construction industry, from truly great marketing? Fear. <laughs> Um, just fear of, you know, what the outcome is going to be, are they, you know, going to judge me or whatever, but you know, that's part of it. And you, you have to try things and see how the market goes just as long as you, you know, have your ducks in a row, you have a strategy, um, you know, you really understand and know your customer, their pain points and are checking to make sure that the imagery video you use is safe. Uh, you're running it by your safety director. You know, I've seen some really cheesy marketing that does really well. 
um, up to really boring professional, you know, the CEO just talking to the camera and no one really cares what he says. So, um, you know, just keep experimenting and trying. And that's what marketing is kind of all about. And eventually you'll, you'll see, um, also keep an eye on what's trending. Um, you know, a lot of the social media have like trending corners, YouTube has it, LinkedIn has it, see what people are talking about, um, on Google and YouTube, you can start typing in, for example, um, commercial painting or something, and then a list is going to populate. Those are the things that people are searching. So the, that's going to give you ideas for content, um, whether it's video, blogs, whatever. That's what people want to learn about. So that will give you ideas. Jenny, you want to go next? Sure, I'll go next. Um, I see somebody put in their time. Fear is a very good answer. Um, I think people forget are all so busy and they forget how much it takes to actually with strategy put something together put a plan in place but honestly at the end of the day as long as you're authentic and intentional with how you present yourself then people are going to want to work with you you just have to be visible in the in the um industry um as I said in the beginning, people work with people. So empower your people to have their have your message and let them just go out there and do what they do. Mm -hmm. um, I would I would echo those things, and I'd say the 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 biggest thing holding people back is the same thing holding people back and causing the trades industry to struggle to have have people in it, which is just a wrong belief overall. People have a wrong belief about what the trades are, about mm -hmm. construction jobs. Or HVAC jobs or we're still shoveling our kids to college because gosh I don't want them to dig ditches or lay brick or whatever and it's a wrong belief because mm -hmm. I know an awful lot of rich people that work in and own construction companies um, but a wrong belief about marketing about LinkedIn about its value about social media a wrong belief about having a website a wrong belief about the time yes everything takes time but it may not take as much time as you thought we're talking crawl walk run um, set small, manageable, attainable goals. One post a week, you're you're doing better than than uh, you have in the past if you haven't done anything. And so, just general wrong beliefs about marketing, about how much it will cost, um, you know, those kinds of things. I I love talking to people about these things. Um, you know, exploring exploring ideas, things you can do, so forth. Um, so, if you want to talk to me, I'd love to talk with you that uh, about ideas or things you can do and. Um, being on LinkedIn is huge if you haven't gathered that from today and it's free and there's phenomenal ways you can network with your customers and uh, you just need to think about it differently and, and fight that wrong belief because I think wrong belief about marketing, what it costs, the time it takes, who can do it, your messaging just creates what they said a lot of fear and so um, but but consequently people do nothing instead so I would say that wrong belief. I love that. I think that's such a good place to land. Um, and I liked what you said about uh, like the response that you gave to Mark of uh, Mark shared and Mark Drury shared in the chat, fear of sharing your secret sauce. And Seth responded, true, but the highest form of flattery is someone copying your work, right? <laughs> which is which is great. But also um, I'm reading Seth Godin's famous Purple Cow book. I'm sure anyone who's in marketing is familiar. Um, and I really truly believe that there is no secret sauce. Uh, you can go to any Michelin star restaurant and you're not gonna have different ingredients. The, the ingredients stay the same. It's the, it's the presentation and the execution. And, and people can't steal that from you. That's yours. That, that's what makes you remarkable. So don't be afraid to share your value. We give away a ton of value on our website. Um, we're always free with our knowledge because that's not what makes us who we are, you know, that's, that's our service. That's our people. And they can't, they can't clone that. So don't be, don't be afraid to share. Um, thank you all. So thank you all so much for joining me today. It was so much fun to have all three of you in a conversation today. Um, thank you all uh, for attending. I hope you got a lot of value from it. Please, if you're on LinkedIn, follow everyone. Um, they all talk about marketing and, and share their value freely there. 
Um, I, I mostly talk about books actually. So, so maybe not quite as valuable to follow me. <laughs> Join us on the uh, morning huddle. Every oh, yes. Tuesday at 8 a.m. on LinkedIn. Just a little plug there. We talk about all trending topics only for 20 minutes. And then uh, you're welcome to ask our guests a Q&A for 10 minutes. So every awesome. Tuesday on LinkedIn. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much. Thank you all so Thanks much. Thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.